Within our Theology of Joy grant, he sits on both the Project Leadership Team and the Joy Adolescent Faith and Flourishing Advisory Board. He is a member of the International Association for the Study of Youth Ministry and the International Bonhoeffer Society. To name just a few, his publications include his first book, Revisiting Relational Ministry, which really presented a new trajectory for youth ministry, offering the field one of the first robust theological projects. Since then, Andy Rue has been busy. He has published 12 books, many of which have been found on lists for books of the year, including his 2011 book with Kendall Creasy Dean entitled The Theological Turn in Youth Ministry, which was awarded Christianity to Today's Book Merit in 2012. His books, The Promise of Despair, The Relational Pastor, and The Christio Praxis have all offered new visions for pastoral practice and practical theology. Andy would identify himself as a constructor of ideas, which can be seen, of course, in his many publications. But he is also passionate about mentoring young scholars as they seek to construct their ideas. And I might add, Andy is brilliant yet humble, reserved yet humorous. Folks, if you have not heard him present before, you are definitely in for a treat. Presenting with him is Christian Gonzalez. Christian Gonzalez is the Young Adult Ministries Coordinator for the Youth and Young Adult Ministries Department of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of North America. <laughs> I had to take my time with that one. <laughs> He is a husband, father, coffee drinker, sandal wearer, and crossfitter. Christian has an MA from Azusa Pacific University in marriage and family therapy and a second MA in children, youth, and family ministries from Luther Seminary. Christian and his family live in Phoenix, Arizona. Christian has also hosted a video series called The Trench, which discusses the centrality of relationships in the Christian life. This past podcast explore how our relationships make us who we are and how to how we are to engage with others in light of the orthodox christian faith friends would you join me in welcoming andy root and christian gonzalez all right am i on likewise we're good all right thanks for being here um it's wonderful to be with you in this beautiful room so thanks for being here what I want to talk about today is actually try to get under our feet a little bit what actually is joy and how that then relates to ministry and particularly ministry with young people. And I want to get into that by starting with a confession. And here's the confession that uh, a few years ago, as Sarah so kindly uh, introduced, my friend Kenny Creasy Dean and I wrote this book called The Theological Turn in Youth Ministry. And the confession is, I'm not really sure we knew exactly what we were saying when we wrote the book. This is probably true for most authors. It's not until you stand up in front of a group of people and try to condense what you said in the book that you think, oh yeah, that's what we were trying to say. So I don't know if you know this book, but the way I describe this book is it's the book with the really angry kids on the cover. I don't know. I would even dare to say it's that they're pissed. Like these are some mad kids. I don't know why they're so mad, but I think they're mad at you. I don't know why, but I think it's because you didn't buy enough copies. So. You can rectify that by going onto Amazon right now and getting a few copies of this book. Uh, but when we wrote this book, like I said, we weren't, I don't think, as clear about what we were asking youth workers to turn away from and what we were asking them to turn towards. And I want us to get clear on this, and I think that will help us think about actually what we mean when we talk about joy and the experience of joy and what actually joy is. Now, I think we were very clear that when we said we wanted youth workers to take a turn, we did ask them to take a turn away from thinking about youth ministry as a technology, to not think about youth ministry as a technology. Now, I need to be careful when I say that, because when you're in a group of uh, pastors and people on the cutting edge of think rethinking ministry, it's amazing if you're in a room, particularly with young pastors, if you insult the Bible, they think that you're pretty cutting edge, but if you insult Twitter, they will kill you in the hallway. Yeah. So let me say this very clearly. I like technology. I'm a gadget guy. I used to have an Apple Watch until the battery went bad, so that means I'm better than all of you. Like, I like technology. I'm into technology. But I do think there's a way that technology frames our kind of conception of reality. 
And the way that technology can frame our conception of reality is it tends to make this assertion that everything we meet in the world is a problem and there's some technical solution to solve that problem. A kind of technological mindset says everything's a problem and there's some functional solution to solve that problem. And don't we kind of feel that? I mean, don't we know like ice caps are melting, ecological disaster could be around the corner, but somewhere deep inside of us we think, yeah, it's going to be bad, but someone's going to create an app to fix it. I know it. Um, like we have this sense that we could fix these things with technology. Now let me show you a quick diagram, and my wife does say that you have to be on drugs to understand my diagrams, so smoke them if you got them. Here we go, ready? So we could think of technology like this, that technology is science that is used to solve a problem that then creates a new form which should bring exponential growth. The best way for me to think about this is Apple. So when Apple, I think it was the iPhone derivative of 5 to 5S, that Apple realized they had a problem. And the problem was a security issue with the home button of the phone. So what they do, they got their best technicians and technologists on it, and they came up with a new form of the home button that would actually read your fingerprint. They knew they would put that in the next derivative of iPhones, and it would move massive amounts of units, and Apple stock would go up. Now the point I think we were trying to say when we were talking about a theological turn in youth ministry and to turn away from thinking about youth ministry as a technology is I think for the last 40, 50 years that youth ministry particularly has been the Protestant church's technology. We got a problem. The problem is our kids. They don't like church. They don't want to read the Bible. They're making bad decisions. So what we're going to do is we're going to get a youth ministry or a youth ministry program going. That will solve our problem. But it, of course, always leads to some kind of new form. And we're always youth workers looking for what's the next big thing? How do we, where do we find it? Where do we get it? What, what are you doing? How can I do this? And it should then bring exponential growth. And I can tell you I know many, many youth workers who have died on this hill where church officials come to them and say, hey, uh, we hired you and we've asked you to work 40 hours and be paid for 15. Um, but we're just not seeing the growth that we thought we were going to see. I mean, we invested this. We were supposed to see 20, 30 percent of attendance growth and at least the coolness of our church to rise, and we're not seeing it. So, um, you know, we either need you to go to a conference and find the next new gadget, or uh, we need you to get cooler, or we need you to leave and find someone better. And so I think we were really asking youth workers to turn away from thinking about this as a technology. And that did lead us into writing the book. And one of the things that I would say as we continue to think about joy in the midst of this is that we would talk to these youth workers, and they'd been at youth ministry sometimes five, ten years, and they had lost the joy that they had realized that a lot of the people that were overseeing them, that the point was to build some kind of program, and they didn't know how they could talk about the act and being of God, how they could find any joy in the life together with young people, how they could find any joy in their vocation, because they're always trying to find the next technological solution to solve the church's problem. So we asked youth workers to turn away from thinking about youth ministry as a technology which is fairly obvious, but the second one I think is less so, and it was actually in talking to groups of people like this that it became more clear to me, is that we did ask people to turn away or to not think about this as the theology turn in youth ministry. Now after I would write this book and was talk to groups of people um, like you all in a room, I would talk about it a little bit, and then I'd have somebody come up to me after, and they would say, hey, thanks so much for writing this book. It's like, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, I'd say, yeah, it's great. It's like, yeah, thank you. And then they would say something to me like, you know, because I've just been saying for years, like all we have to do is get 12-year-olds to read Paul Tillich and everything would be okay. <laughs> and I never knew really how to respond because they just had complimented me. So I was like, I don't think that's what we meant. But did we mean that? Uh, let me be the first to say, I don't think that will work very well. Actually, one of my first experiences, like official experiences in ministry, is I the home church that I had grown up in. I was a freshman in college, and they asked me to be a confirmation mentor. And we we're going to have some fall retreat for the ninth graders, and for some reason I couldn't make it up on the church bus that went up to the, to the camp for this confirmation retreat. So I had to drive up with Ryan. I was a first-year undergrad college student. Ryan was a first-year seminary student. God bless first-year seminary students, but... Um, all first-year seminary students, we love them, but they are a little bit annoying. And um, that's right where Ryan was. He was like, you know, 10 weeks into this thing, eight weeks into this thing, and he was just a little bit annoying. But we were driving up, and Ryan uh, said to me, he gave me this kind of little speech. He said, you know, I have to give the talk tomorrow afternoon. 
we just have to be done with this in youth ministry. Like this fun and game stuff, it's got to be about something deeper. we got to give kids theology. That's what we have to give them. Now, at the time, I couldn't even spell theology, so that sounded like a great idea to me. I was like, yeah, that sounds good. So we pulled into the camp and kind of slammed our doors and got ready to enter into the camp chaos. And he looked at me one more time and he said, you watch. Tomorrow, I'm going to give these kids theology. Sure enough, Saturday afternoon came along, and I guess, boy, did he give them theology. It was about 25 minutes of everything he had learned in his first semester at seminary. There were parsed Hebrew verbs, about 10 minutes on the temple structure of ancient Israel, a little bit of a debate about Pauline epistle authorship. I mean, this went on and on. And I watched these ninth graders. Every five minutes, the minutia of his theology just dragged them to the floor. There was no joy in that room anywhere. And finally, he like prayed for them, and they almost like they were a choir or something, all stood up in unison and raced out the back door to leave the minutia of his theology. I love theology. If I could only read in one more subject, I would read in theology. I'd read in systematic theology, but I'm not sure, well, I am sure that that's not what we were going for, and I'm not sure that will actually help us and get to these experiences, these deep experiences of joy that we actually want. Lucky for us, we had the title right. And it really was asking people to take a theological turn. But I don't think we were so clear on what that theological turn actually meant. What I think is different about the theological as it relates to theology is the theological starts somewhere different. It actually starts with the concrete and lived experience of young people. It actually starts in relationship with young people themselves as opposed to some kind of theoretical idea. Now, that's a tough move I just made. Uh, the difference between theology and the theological, you have just put food into your stomach, and that seems fuzzy. So let me give you uh, maybe a concrete example of what that actually looks like. And I want to draw here from a story from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And just a few years ago, I wrote a book called uh, Bonhoeffer as Youth Worker, because I have this sense, and most of Bonhoeffer's scholarship kind of has this sense, that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, this incredible Lutheran pastor, theologian, makes top ten lists of um, most important Christians in the 20th century. His books, like The Cost of Discipleship, will be top ten of uh, most important uh, Christian books written in the 20th century. That I had this sense that Bonhoeffer was actually doing a lot of youth ministry. And sometimes that would come up in Bonhoeffer scholarship. So I decided to kind of explore that. And to my shock, um, I, it is not an overstatement to say all of the ministry that one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century did was either with children or youth. From 1925 to 1939, all the ministry that this man did um, was youth ministry or children's ministry. He really is a theologian with young people on his mind, or he's a youth worker who's doing theological um, thinking. Now, I want to tell you a story about Bonhoeffer, but the first thing you always have to know when you're going to talk about Bonhoeffer is that if you want to feel bad about yourself, you just read the biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. <laughs> And mainly because Bonhoeffer was a theological genius. So this will make you feel bad. He starts his doctoral dissertation at the University of Berlin at 19 years old. He finishes it at 21. And now you're thinking, I have done nothing with my life. Thank you. I just, I've done nothing. So he finishes at 21, but he's got a big problem. And the big problem is that at this time in Germany, you do need to be 25 to qualify to be ordained. And he's in the ordination process. Um, and you also pretty much need to be 25 to have a lectureship in the university. So he's gone too fast, and he doesn't know what to do. So his ordination committee says, why don't you get out of Berlin and go do a year-long internship in Barcelona? You need some ministry experience. So Dietrich had already started in 1925 doing youth ministry and children's ministry in this local church. He heads off to Barcelona to a German-speaking church in Barcelona, and he is going um, to be the pastoral assistant. And he gets, he gets his uh, hands dirty right away, of course, in youth ministry and in children's ministry. That's what he does. Well, what's really fascinating and interesting is that we have a letter during this time um, in 1928 that Dietrich wrote to a friend named Walter Dress. Now, Walter Dress will eventually marry Dietrich's youngest sister, um, Susanna, but uh, he's studying for the ministry as well, and Dietrich didn't have too many people he could talk about ministry with, so he writes in this letter. Now, what's fascinating about the letter is we don't discover it until 1999. It was written to a man by the name of Walter Dress, and when Walter Dress died, they cleaned out his apartment, found a cache of letters, and in 1999, there it is, a letter from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But the letter itself is fascinating. It's worth reading in, in whole, but it starts like this. Dietrich writes him and says, 
Uh, Walter, did I tell you, uh, did, I, did I talk to you uh, about Emil Brunner's new book? Emil Brunner is this very famous theologian on the continent at the time. He's probably the second most famous theologian, important theologian behind Karl Barth at this time. Very significant. He writes this book called The Divine Imperative, which is going to be a book about ethics. Dietrich, since his own high school days, has been interested in ethics. He can't wait for this book. So he says to Walter Dress, have you read Brunner's book? And then Dietrich goes, I hated it. Terrible book. I mean, I was so looking forward to this book, and it met none of my expectations. Oh, Bruner, you should be ashamed of yourself. This book, oh, it was awful. It was terrible. He even says, I had to quit 90 pages before the end. Oh, Bruner, terrible. So here is this snot-nosed kid who's just finished. The ink on his dissertation is still wet, and he rips apart Emil Bruner for this book he writes. But then the whole letter switches. And I'm sure what happened is Dietrich remembered something that happened in his ministry and he needed to tell Walter Dress. And now it becomes almost like a CPE verbatim. And the whole thing changes. He said, wait, 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 did I, did I tell you what happened to me? And Dietrich goes out and says, um, the other day I asked these people in my congregation if I could borrow something. So they sent their 10-year-old son over to drop off what I'd asked for. He says, I know this boy. I know this boy so well. He's the, the epitome of upbeat. He's excitable. He's the kind of kid in Sunday school you can't get to sit still. But he came into my flat, and I noticed that the boy was down. He was sullen, and he was sad. So Dietrich tells Walter that he just attuned himself to the boy's humanity. He was just aware that he had this experience. Finally, Dietrich says to him, is everything okay? And the boy just starts sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. Dietrich tells Walter Dress that what he does, I mean, this is a different time, this is 1920s, that he picks the boy up, he puts him on his knee, and he just holds this 10-year-old boy, just sobbing. That's essentially it. Dietrich just ministers to him. Dietrich isn't thinking, hey, the boy is weak now. It's time to get the Sunday school lesson in his head. He isn't thinking anything like that. He's just thinking, be with this boy. Well, he's sitting with him, and the boy's crying, and all of a sudden, Dietrich starts to be able to make out words amongst the tears. He's starting to hear, Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, Mr. Wolf is dead. Mr. Wolf is dead. And Dietrich says to Walter Dress, and who is Mr. Wolf? Oh, Mr. Wolf is a three-year-old German shepherd dog that's just died. And Dietrich gives this boy space, and he narrates his experience. He tells Dietrich about how much he loved this dog, how meaningful this dog was to him, how the dog woke him up every morning, met him after school, how deeply he loved this dog, and Dietrich just sat with him. Reminds me of one of my first paid youth ministry experiences. I had worked for this organization called Young Life, and one of our major objectives was to get kids who had never heard the gospel story before to go to camp. And at camp, they would hear the gospel story. And the whole objective of the ministry was to get kids, you know, who were kids had no relationship to the church. Well, one of the kind of subtexts of working for this organization was it really was your job to fill your camp spots. The camps are amazing. Make sure you fill all your camp spots. It's my first year, first time I'm getting a paycheck to do youth ministry, and I fill my camp spots. So I think, of course, youth ministry. It's freaking easy. Like, you know, one year, and here I fill out my camp spots. This is easy. One of the kids I had my on the bus was, was Adam. And Adam was about 6'2", ninth grader. Um, this was in Minnesota, and he had played varsity hockey as a ninth grader, which meant that he was mean. I mean, this was a mean kid. He would cross-check you in the teeth if he needed to. He had never heard the gospel story before, and here he was on the bus. Well, we get up to camp, and um, the, just a few hours after, after we, we arrive, there's the club. And at the club, they'll meet, we'll have a club every night. But this first one, you're going to hear some songs, and there'll be some games. And then the speaker will come out, and the speaker will start to share the gospel story. And mainly just kind of get to know the kids, but start with the gospel story. Well, this is the first night. We're only three hours in the camp. And we're at club, and I look over to the side, and there he is. There's Adam. He's sitting against the wall, and he's crying. So I think what any youth worker thinks, I think, we got him. We got him. So I'm sensitive, new in ministry, but sensitive enough to wait until the room clears out. And now Adam has his hands on his head, and he's sobbing. And I come up to him and said, Adam, you want to go for a walk? He says, yeah. And we walk around this camp, and he's just like this boy. I mean, he's sobbing. And I said, Adam, what's up? And the tears come, just like this boy, just sobbing. And he starts saying, it's just, it's just. And I know what it just is. 
it's just Jesus. That's what it is, right? He says, it's just, I'm like, yeah, come on. It's just, now I'm thinking, like, what chapter in the book will it be? Like, of course, he's going to, this night will change his life. He's going to become a missionary. He's going to write his biography someday. Well, I, will the chapter about me be in the first three chapters of the book or the last three? I mean, of course, I'm going to get my uh, chapter just to me. This is what I'm thinking as he's trying to collect himself. He says, it's just, it's just, like, come on, man, it's just Jesus. And he says, it's just, it's just, it's just she doesn't even know I exist. And I did say it. I bit my lips so hard it started to bleed. But I thought to myself, you stupid kid. We're talking about Jesus and eternity, and all you care about is this girl. And then it became like a flashback. Like you get a scene from a movie, and I realized, oh, wait, 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 wait. That's right. He was on the bus, and he was flirting with this girl. Wait a minute, wait. She signed up to go to camp before he ever did. Wait, he didn't sign up to go to camp because he thought I was a great youth worker. He signed up to be with this girl and right before club, he asked her out because he had dreams that he was going to spend a romantic week with this girl he had a crush on forever. Right before they went into the club, she said no and rejected him. He didn't hear a word the speaker said. He was just crying in the corner because his love he had yearned for rejected him. Now, I don't need to tell you people, but not great ministry on my part that night. I mean, maybe he doesn't remember this girl's name now. But that was a real experience of rejection and loss. And if I can speak to the depth of God's activity in that, well, where is the gospel in the midst of that moment? Well, lucky for us, Dietrich does much better than I do. And the boy says, Mr. Wolf is dead. And Dietrich, like I said, gives him this space to narrate his experience, to be with the boy. And Dietrich just holds the boy and is just with him. And that's, like I said, about it. That's the point. Except something happens. The boy wipes the tears from his eyes turns to Dietrich and says, Herr Bonhoeffer, you tell me now, will I see Mr. Wolf again in heaven? Will I see Mr. Wolf again? And Dietrich tells Walter Dress he had no idea what to say. And he actually says to Walter Dress, when the boy asked him this question, this is the exact words he used, he said, I felt small next to this boy's question. Now think of that parallelism of that. First paragraph of this letter he rips apart one of the greatest theologians on the continent for his theology. But then a 10-year-old boy comes into his presence and asks him a question about his dead dog. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer feels small. The thing you need to know about Dietrich Bonhoeffer is he never felt small. He knew that this was his biggest spiritual issue was his own arrogance, his own confidence. Every room this man went into, he felt like he was the smartest person in the room. It's a great story of Dietrich in New York City in 1930 when he was a, a student studying. And uh, Paul Lehman, who had become a very well-known um, ethicist, uh, was a student as well, finishing his dissertation, became friends with Dietrich. And Dietrich was laying on his dorm bed reading a book. Beautiful, beautiful day in New York City. And Lehman comes in with two tennis rackets and says, Dietrich, it's a beautiful day. Let's, let's go play tennis. And Dietrich sighed deeply, put the book down on his chest and said, no, Paul. No, no, Paul. That will be no fun for you because I am far too good. <laughs> That's just who Dietrich Bonhoeffer was. And he said he had to pray about this often, that his own arrogance was always getting in his way. And yet, here he is, at the hubris of being a young man, and the question from a 10-year-old boy throws him back on his heels. He steps into something that's really div divine ground, holy ground. The question of a 10-year-old boy about his dead dog becomes a profound experience to him. So Dietrich, this arrogant theologian, is feeling small. And he says in the letter, he says, unfortunately for me, the boy wanted a yes or no answer. And so he couldn't do, like some of us learned uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, how to do pastoral care, which is you just repeat back what the person's feeling. So they say, I'm really upset because, my, um, because I'm really grieving my, uh, the, the death of, of, of my grandmother. You say, I hear you saying that you're really de de grieving the death of your grandmother. Like you just repeat back their experience. Basically, Dietrich said, I could try that. It wasn't going to work here. Like, this boy wanted a yes or no answer. And he says, I didn't know what to say. Dietrich said, I had no idea what to say. I felt small. And essentially, he says, the whole PhD seminar on dead dogs, I didn't take that class. I had no idea what to say. But he has to answer. And so finally, Dietrich says, well, we know that God is love. And we know, oh, we know that God loves you. And God loves all animals too. So yes, yes, I think that someday you'll see Mr. Wolf 
again in heaven. So for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, all dogs do go to heaven. That's good news for some of us. But here we are. I mean, Dietrich has to struggle with a deep theological question because it's asked from the concrete experience of this young boy. We've been talking and kind of framing this conversation about the canonic move, the self-emptying move. Dietrich didn't go into that experience and say, I'm going to do the bold thing and throw off all my selfishness. He went in and encountered the concrete lived humanity of this young person. And encountering the depth of this young person's experience, it threw him back onto holy ground to feel small. But feel small in a way that allowed him to minister to this boy. That ministry actually precedes theology here. That it's in and through ministry that this incredibly profound thing happens. Now what's really fascinating to me, and doing this lecture has helped me even think about this more, is to give you a, a quote from the letter. This is what Dietrich says to Walter Dress after he says this. And Dietrich basically said, I, I didn't know if this was the right theological answer, but as you all know when you're in ministry, you don't get the safe place to go write a paper on this. You just have to answer. So he did this, and this is, he says, what, how the boy responds. He says, the boy... He says to Walter Dress, you should have seen the happy face on this boy. Now, I haven't yet gone back to the German on this, but I think it's more than, like, hey, he's happy that he got a new toy. This is a deeper kind of happy. He says, he had completely stopped crying. And then this boy says this, so then I'll see Mr. Wolf again when I, when I am dead. Then we can play together again. In a word, Dietrich says, he was ecstatic. And another says he comes out of himself. That the boy's deep question throws Dietrich out of himself to minister to this boy. And then this boy, getting this answer, throws him into joy. That really, what is joy? Joy is the emotive experience of finding another who will minister to you. Who will give meaning to your deep question. Who will stand with you and be with and for you. The only response is the ecstatic experience that your life has been shared in. Joy is the experience of being ministered to. Joy is a theoretical theological uh, theoretical theology it's actually the theological experience of having your concrete experience expressed and shared and ministered to ministry actually i think in many ways produces this deep experience of joy now one last element of this story that's i think quite profound for us in youth ministry is that the experience of joy being ministered to then should lead one, I think, into wrestling with the theological tradition itself or thinking theologically. And we've been worried in youth ministry for a long time because it feels like young people don't really know much about the Christian story. And what's fascinating as this story ends is that Dietrich tells Walter Dress that after he said this, first of all, that he was shocked that this happened, that this boy in this experience of ministry, of him being kind of sent back on his heels and having to share this boy's experience becomes a real manifestation of an experience of joy. And then he says the boy takes it as delight. And then he says the boy turns to him and says, you know, I scolded Adam and Eve today because they ate that fruit. And because they ate that fruit, Mr. Wolf had to die. And then he started to tell Dietrich about what he had learned in his religion class, what he had learned in other Sunday school classes. Essentially what the boy does is he does the theological himself. He starts thinking about where God is acting and moving. He starts drawing from the Christian tradition into his life. But what the boy needs, it's not a theology professor, he needs a minister. He needs a shared experience where joy bursts forth and his experience is bore next to the experience of the movement of God. And it brings forth this, this, this transformation that leads him even to thinking about the Christian tradition. What our young people desperately need are experiences of joy. But the way they're going to get these experiences of joy is that they need ministers. They need ministers who will stand with them, who will hear their questions, that will help them seek for God next to these big questions of what is my lifetime and why do I live it? Where is God next to my rejection? Where is God next to my fear? Where is God here? That these become, when we can articulate those experiences and find one ministering to us through those, those become these incredible, ecstatic, eventful experiences of finding ourselves swept up into joy, into the very life of God who takes what is dead and makes it alive. Now let me share just one more story with you, and I'm going to pass it over to Christian who can give us some more practices to think about this. So a few years ago now, and I'm almost ashamed to share this story, but I got a phone call, and I got a phone call from a, a large church on the West Coast, and they said, hey, um, we have this youth ministry, and we are actually considering letting our, our middle school minister go. Uh, things just aren't working out, but we would like some kind of 
outside consultation on this, and we're wondering if you would come out and, and, and give us some feedback, observe and give us some feedback. Now, when you get that kind of phone call, your response should be, no, thank you. I want to be no part of, of anyone being fired. I will not do that. Now, what you need to know is they called in February from Southern California. I live in Minneapolis. All your ethics go away when you think, two days in the sun. Next thing I knew, I found myself on a plane flying to uh, Southern California to do this, to do this uh, review. And on the plane, I did feel like George Clooney and up in the air. You know, if you've seen that movie, like, what am I doing here? Well, I got there, and the first thing they wanted me to do was just observe the, the middle school ministry. It was in a room about this size, and there were 30, 40, 50 kids. I don't know, a lot of them. And the young woman who I was supposed to re review was there. She didn't even know why I was there, and I was just supposed to kind of hang out against the wall and observe this. Well, as the night started, there was a group of boys, and they were in the back, and they were quite literally running up the wall. They would run up the wall and then mark how high they got up the wall and then see who could get higher. The girls were huddled, passing notes. Um, then the boys transitioned. I mean, they're California kids after all, so they started surfing on the back of their chairs. So they get, like, the back two legs going and see how long they could stay on it. And I'm sitting watching this all. This isn't before it starts. This is like she's trying to lead them through Bible study right now. She's trying to lead them through some singing. And no one is engaged at all. And there is a kind of frenetic energy of happiness and, and excitement going on. So then the boys start um, kicking each other in the face. Um, like a boy would stand like this, and then they would kick, and they would see how close they could get to each other's face without actually kicking. Like, oh, dude, you're like this far away. And I was sitting in the corner thinking, oh, yeah. She's getting fired. This is not good. This is not good at all. Except the last seven minutes. She grabs the mic. This weird quiet comes over the kids. And she says, now we're going to pray like we do. And a kid raised her hand. She passed her the mic. And she said in her kind of eighth grade, kind of emo-ish, California way, she said, um, like, um, like, I just like, you know, like, really like, need like prayer because like, I'm like, dealing with it again. I had no idea what it was, but clearly the rest of the room did. An adult leader kind of gave her a look, um, patted her on the shoulder. She sat down, a boy raised his hand, they passed him the mic, and he prayed for her. Another boy raised his hand, they passed him the mic. He said, yeah, maybe you heard in church on Sunday, but my mom's cancer might be back, and we're all really scared. And he sat down, another kid raised his hand, they passed him the mic, and he prayed for him. And so it went on for about seven minutes. The woman in charge grabbed the mic, prayed for the group, said amen, and immediately the boys went back to kicking each other in the face. <laughs> the next day I went into the review meeting, and this committee, I mean, they had like blood dripping from their teeth. They're like, so what should we do? Should we, you know, should we, should we, you know, should we get rid of her? And I said, Absolutely not. I mean, she needs some help. She could really use some other skills and some help. But what more do you want? Here are a group of kids confessing the depth of their lived experience in ministering to one another, praying for one another. And I even now, kind of thinking back of all this conversation we've done about joy, it was ecstatic and it was spazzy in there. But after watching them pray together, it was a tangible, tasting reality of joy was what was going on in the room. And she could have used some help with crowd control. She could have used some, some more skills. But what more do you want? Kids confessing their lived experience, ministering to one another. And what else can come out of that but joy? Joy is the tangible, felt experience of being ministered to or ministering to another by this God who comes to us in Jesus Christ as one who ministers to us. So I'm going to pass this over to Christian, and he can take it from here. Press that button. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, so, as everything Andy was saying, I mean, all of that with Bonhoeffer, that's all really good for Bonhoeffer. He's never sinned ever. I get it. Uh, we all get it. Bonhoeffer wins. We suck. We lose. Uh, so, the question for us then becomes how do we, as uh, fledgling Bonhoeffers, uh, really step into this kind of ability to minister? to people, to be able to 
empty ourselves enough in order to make room for the experiences of other people. And uh, I, I do think that there are some, some ways that we can find our way into this kind of like self-emptying path toward joy. Um, the joy of ministering to one another, the joy of being ministered to. And, and as we minister to our young people, we can actually begin the work of forming them as these self-emptying ministers as well. So everything that I'm uh, going to be talking about too, as I, as I work for the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, I also lead the youth group at my, at my parish as well. So I have some kind of hands-on experience in actually dealing with teenagers and trying to do stuff on the ground as well. Um, but one of the obstacles that often happens for us as we're trying to stand in the experiences of other people is actually we get in the way ourselves, right? We, we are actually really full of ourselves, and we uh, can't be filled with the Spirit of God. We can't be filled with Christ if we're too full of ourselves. If we're thinking about ourselves, always uh, wanting to make ourselves comfortable, wanting to, you know, if someone comes to us and they're in a lot of pain uh, well, because of, like, mirror neurons and empathy and all this kind of stuff, we end up getting really anxious ourselves, and we're like, uh, it's, uh, it's okay. It's going to be okay, I think, maybe. I hope, I hope I'm going to be okay. And so when we're trying to soothe these other people, we're actually simply trying to soothe ourselves, uh, which is not exactly the path toward, you know, canonic youth ministry. It's actually some kind of weird self-serving thing. Uh, so... What Christ shows us, however, is that the path to joy, as it says in Hebrews 12, that it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. Uh, and so the practice, as he tells us, if we're going to be his disciples, if we're going to be ministers in like, this Christ way of being, then our own path, the path to joy, the path to ministry, is actually by way of taking up the cross, of practicing it willingly in our lives every moment of every day, uh, because the reality is, when someone comes to us with their own need, when someone comes to us and expects us to minister to them, uh, if we are not in the habit of reflexively laying down our lives for someone else uh, when the stakes are low, we're not going to do it when the stakes are high. Right? You wouldn't send a battalion of troops into war without first sending them to boot camp. You wouldn't first give them the tools and the practices that they need in order to, to survive in battle. So too, as ministers... We're not going to be able to lay down our lives for people when they need us to if we're not practicing laying down our lives when it's unnecessary. Does that make sense? Uh, so, it is through the cross, then, that joy comes into the world. Uh, so there's a couple practices that I kind of want to look at uh, in our youth ministry practices. So the first one is silence. Silence, uh, in my youth group, is something that we start every youth group with. We spend 10 to 15 minutes, just the kids put their cell phones away, and they break off into different parts uh, of the room. Because the reality is we live in a culture that is really self-obsessed. Uh, we are, you know, we propagate it a lot as well with our Twitter feeds and our, you know, we think of our lives in 140 characters and how we need to really make ourselves known, right? We live in what Charles Taylor calls the age of authenticity, where everything is about self-expression. Me, 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 me. How can I show you who I am by how I dress? How can I let you, how can I let the world know what's going on inside on my Facebook feed or whatever? And I'll compulsively check my phone to see if it's gotten any likes. Because not only do I need to express myself, but I actually need you to validate that self-expression as well. Right? So there's this kind of constant feedback cycle that's always going. But the reality is we're never going to be able to listen to other people if we can't first shut up. <laughs> right? If we're talking all the time, we're not listening. That's why I'm sure you've heard that it's, it's more important to listen. That's why God gave us two ears and only one mouth. So we should be listening twice as much as we're talking, all that kind of stuff. So that's what we do with our kids. We, send, we put them, have them put their phones away, and they go off. And, and the reality is, like, the thoughts come up. The thoughts keep coming up, right? We're always trying to think. But the silence becomes this way of opening ourselves to the presence of God, of being at least aware that somebody else is in the room, that someone else is there, that there's somebody before us. Because the other reality is that self-expression becomes a burden. It becomes this thing of like needing to feel this compulsive need. But finally, silence becomes a, a freedom. It becomes a way to kind of let go of the self, to not have to worry about things. And it's hard because we like worrying about things. When we're quiet, all the troubles come up. But silence helps prepare us for a real encounter with God in prayer. Because often, even the way we teach kids how to pray is, like, is almost this wish list, right? Of like, well, come let God know everything that's on your mind and uh, let him know what you want. 
But silence becomes this way of understanding that prayer is more than just simply letting God know what you want. It's actually this way of communing with God. And so silence becomes a path into prayer as communion, simply sitting in the Lord's presence. One way that we practice this as well is through uh, an ancient Christian practice called the Jesus Prayer, the words of which are very simple. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And so we teach our kids this prayer that, that prayer becomes simply about communing with God, becoming aware that God is there. Uh, the second practice that I would turn our attention to is one of fasting. Again, as Americans, we're really used to getting whatever we want whenever we want it, right? I mean, you could leave here and find any variety of restaurants in the area uh, that you could stop at pretty much 24 hours a day and get whatever you want. We become so accustomed to making ourselves comfortable that we don't really know what to do when we're uncomfortable. And so fasting becomes this way of willingly, voluntarily making oneself uncomfortable. Of saying, hey, I'm going to put my own desires aside willingly so that I can become the kind of person who's used to feeling uncomfortable. So that when someone comes to me and says, hey, you know what, I think I'm beginning to have some questions about my sexuality. Well, we're not uncomfortable because I'm comfortable being uncomfortable. Let's talk about the thing then. You say what you need to have. I don't need to have my way. I don't need to feel comfortable. I don't need you to put me at ease because I've been used to willingly putting myself at unease, right? Now we become the kind of people who actually have room for the uncomfortable experiences of others. Uh, fasting, again, it becomes this way of, of letting go of the will, of being able to say, I mean, could you imagine, right, if, you're, if you were the kind of person who in traffic, when you got cut off, were just like, oh, um, everything's okay, and you didn't get angry? Wouldn't that be so great? <laughs> like, just to have that kind of burden-free life, you know, where you weren't resentful, and you weren't, like, angry because you, someone got in your way? Like, since when do you own the entire freeway? But that's how I think. If someone cuts me off, they're getting in my way. But fasting becomes this way of willingly putting the self aside, of being able to take up the cross, and to be able to live life without this kind of resentment, without this kind of frustration, because we're practicing it. I mean, of course the frustration and all that stuff is still going to come, but we become a little bit more uh, skillful at handling it when it does arise. Uh, so, I guess in, in the youth ministry world, one of the things that I would point us to is that, it, at least in the, in the Orthodox Church, we have a prescribed fast. The prescribed fast is on, at least on Wednesdays and Fridays, where we abstain from uh, meat, dairy, uh, any alcohol. I mean, hopefully, you know, kids are abstaining from alcohol anyway. Uh, but the meat and dairy thing is something that actually becomes surprisingly difficult and surprisingly tiring. Uh, we are in the middle of Lent right now. And that's the same fast that's prescribed for the 40 days of Lent, uh, as well as the nine days after Lent that we have that the Western Christian world does not have. So we have 40 days before we have Holy Week. So we've got 40 days, then we've got a weekend, and then we've got seven more days. And so we have 49 days of fasting totally. Uh, but this, this fast is prescribed, and the important part of this is that we're not the ones choosing what we want to give up. Because that becomes yet one more way that the person can express their own will. Right? Like, well, I'm going to give up chocolate for Lent. Well, I, personally, I could give up chocolate for Lent. I don't really like chocolate, so that's not gonna, I'm not going to miss out on much. Right? But that puts my will, that reinforces that what I want is most important and that I'm choosing what to fast from. So in the youth group world, what we can do is commit to a, a communal fast of some kind. Perhaps we're all going to fast from the Internet for 40 days. Perhaps we're all going to fast from food some kind of food product together. Maybe it's the meat and the dairy thing. But the important thing is that as a community, we're all undertaking this practice together. That we're laying down our will and dying to ourselves as a body. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of ways to live into the fasting thing. Practice number three is Bible study. And I don't just mean Bible study in the sense of like going back to the Bible and looking at it from this historical kind of context or trying to draw and extract some moral lesson that you then apply to your lives, right? Like, oh, well, this shows that we're supposed to be really nice to people, so let's be really nice to people. Uh, but rather, to see the Bible, the Bible itself as a living text through which the living Word of God, Jesus Christ himself, comes to encounter us. Because the reality is we don't like to see ourselves clearly. Uh, St. Isaac the Syrian says that it is a greater miracle for one to see oneself as one is than it is to raise the dead. 
Uh, so we have this, this capacity to really ignore ourselves to a large degree, to overlook sin, to overlook uh, who we are in God's eyes, as well as to overlook how God actually interacts with us and engages us. But the scriptures, however, help us see that we ourselves are in the text, that we have to come to confront ourselves through the text. We have to be made uncomfortable first by seeing who we are in order to receive the joy that God has before us as we see how Christ encounters those in the scriptures. So under this understanding, someone can go to the scriptures. And this is what we do with our kids in youth group as well, is we read a story, uh, The Woman at the Well in John 4, for example. Uh, we go to that no longer with the question in mind of, in what ways are you kind of like the woman at the well? Are you like her in any way? How do you think that is? Instead, we go with a presupposition that you are the woman at the well. You are her. And the scriptures are telling you that you have also had five husbands. You've had five husbands, none of which has been the lover of your soul. What are the five husbands that have taken you away from God? What has taken your attention? And so the kid is then moved into this place of self-examination, of needing to look at how one is sinful before the eyes of God, not for the sake of saying, oh, I'm so bad and I'm so whatever, but for the sake, again, of moving into this miraculous self-discovery, this miraculous way of understanding, oh, wow, I'm the woman at the well. Because what we also see in this, right, is not for the sake of shame, but rather for the sake of joy in seeing that Christ stands before the woman at the well and says, I tell you the truth, that whoever drinks of this well will never thirst again. They now are capable of receiving this living water that Christ himself stands before offering. Because that is who we are. We are the woman at the well. That is our interaction with Christ. That is how he stands before us now. Right? It's not just that we're bad and bad and bad, but that Christ is actually really good. And that becomes that even the fact, and even in the face of our sin, even in the face of the fact that we have been adulterous, we are still offered living water and we are still offered life from the true lover of our souls. And so if this is what is going on, and confession is, if confession is a part of your tradition, it's certainly a part of ours, this actually paves the way for a robust practice of confession as well. Because now the kid can be moved into understanding that they have had five lovers, and so they can confess either to uh, an ordained priest or a pastor or a youth, pa youth pastor or whoever, a friend, whatever it may be. But what happens now is we have paved the way for this practice of confession, of self-emptying, excuse me, of self-emptying, no longer feeling the need to justify ourselves, no longer feeling the need to win, but rather being able to be, to be comfortable being uncomfortable as we stare in the face of our own sin. And finally, uh, Andy touched on this a little bit as well with the story of the youth group. What we end our time at youth group doing is we spend the last 20 minutes listening to prayer requests from one another and actually just praying for each other, uh, inviting the young people themselves to pray for one another because they'll never become people of prayer and we'll never become people of prayer who can stand in one another's places unless we're actually doing the praying for one another. And there's nothing more joyful than that, right? To be prayed for by name, to have your person stood, like shared, to have your person shared and presented to God, right? Uh, but we can't do this if we're always living, in, getting in our own way. And so we've emptied ourselves, we've looked at ourselves, we've made a confession, and now we're bringing other people before God. People are bringing us before God, and we're sharing in one another's lives. So intercession finally becomes this, this the full expression of what it looks like to stand in one another's place and to come to God. But each of these practices is a practice that can only be undertaken if one is willing to, <laughs> to take up the cross, to empty the self, to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. This is the only way to do it. And this is the kind of life that is certainly going to be joyful because it is the kind of life that absolutely cannot be touched by death. It can't be touched by it because it has been entered through death through death to the self, death to one's own will, death to one's own desire, one can finally empty oneself enough to stand in the place of another and to receive the presence of God as God works in us and through us to minister to the young people in our midst and to encourage them to become ministers to other people in the world. Thanks. Thank you to Andy and to Christian for a really wonderful presentation, soon to be a major motion picture or at least a theological book. Uh, and thank you for joining us today and thank you for what you do in ministering with young people. I want to just invite you in two directions. First, 
If you haven't already filled out an expression of interest in the summer study program, please do so we can try to hold the space for you and then communicate to you to make sure that we get you registered. Second, we always want to keep covenant with our students and those of you who need to go on to appointments by stopping with some discipline at 120, so we're going to pause. If you need to pack up and go, please go with our love and gratitude for joining us. If you can stay, we've got, uh, Susan has arranged amazing desserts for us back there, as well as coffee. So help yourself to some desserts and coffee, and in five minutes we'll gather again, and we'll follow up with some Q&A with Andy and with Christian. Thank you again for coming. Blessings on your travel home and ministry. For Dr. Root, um, yes. your, uh, your discussion was helpful. Um, I am thinking, though, about um, our youth today, and especially your example of um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer approaching the, uh, the young man um, and experiencing him with his theological question. Yeah. And um, maybe it's my experience, but I think that most of our youth are not coming to us with theological questions. Right. Yeah. Um, and so the, the theological work um, that's going to happen is not being initiated on their end. Right. And they're not doing the secondary um, delving into those questions, let alone the initial question of, will my dog also be in heaven? Yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great question. Um, so yeah, you prefaced your question by saying from your experience, so I can only answer from, from my experience. Uh, I, and maybe I'm quite naive, but I tend to take, I tend to have a lot of faith that if we actually can find ways to really live with each other, that these questions will come up. And I think so often we get pulled back into that technological perspective, like I'm supposed to do something, I'm supposed to solve something, that the freedom of just living our lives together can be enough. And one of my favorite Luther stories is an interaction with Melanchthon. And it's, it's one of those classic Luther, uh, Luther quotes that you all hear, which is Luther saying, if you're going to sin, sin boldly. And if you've ever spent any time in the upper Midwest at a classically uh, Lutheran college, usually that's used for a tagline of a frat. That means, well, if you're going to drink one beer, you might as well drink ten. You know, if you're going to sin, sin boldly. And we lose the context of that actual statement. And what's happening is Melanchthon is very anxious about how the Reformation is taking shape. And he keeps writing Luther with these hypothetical issues. Well, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And what if this happens? What if that happens? Um, and, of course, the joke is it's his first Reformation, so you've got to you know, cut him some slack. Um, but he's really nervous, so he writes Luther. He says, well, what, what about this? What about this? What about this? And that classic line comes from Luther's response in a letter to Melanchthon where he says, Melanchthon. God does not forgive hypothetical sins. Live your life. And then if you're going to sin, sin boldly. But it's actually the freedom to live. And I think what I'm trying to wonder about is, and what Bonhoeffer does here, is that this is all initiated simply from a regular activity of needing to borrow something from someone at church. But he's aware of this young person's experience, and he does take the initiative to ask, what's wrong? What's going on? What's your situation? So are we close enough to our young people to simply say, how are you? Or what's going on? If we would have had more time, one of the biblical texts that I use that I think maybe even illustrates this more clearly is the Mark 9 story where Jesus encounters um, the boy who uh, is having a pretty rough time. And uh, the father has tried to heal him. And the most tragic element of that story is the father goes to the disciples. Jesus isn't there. The way I usually tell it is Jesus isn't there because Jesus is on vacation which is true, he's taken his three best buddies, Peter, James, and John, they've gone on a bromance getaway up in the mountains. This is where the transfiguration happens. And so Jesus is there, the, the father comes with this utter heartbroken, desperate situation, shows up to where Jesus is supposed to be. Like, this is where you encounter Jesus, and shows up and says, I'm here to see Jesus. And they say, ah, we're sorry, Jesus isn't here. Jesus is on vacation. So what can he do other than to say, well, you've been with Jesus, you do something for him. And then they try and the demon isn't cast out. And just tragedy on top of tragedy here. And the father is essentially giving himself over to his fate in this um, chaotic scene, that his boy will never be okay. And just then Jesus walks back into the scene, 
and um, had some harsh words to say to the disciples. But then an incredibly profound thing happens where Jesus turns to the Father and says, how long? How long has your boy been like this? And we tend to miss it because we live in a diagnostic culture, so we think it's a diagnostic question. Like when you go to the doctor and say, how long have your elbow felt like that? How long have you had the rash? How long has it been since your operating system on your computer booted? But it's not a diagnostic question. It's actually the invitation for this father to narrate his experience. The same thing that Dietrich does. Gives the space to narrate his experience. So it isn't, I don't think the onus is on kids coming with theological questions. It's can we create space for them to narrate their experience in big ways or small ways? Can we give them the space to articulate that? And maybe it's as much as the space by saying, how long? How long have you felt alone? So that takes, that's an art form. How do you create that space? Um, but if we are waiting for them, or even more so their parents, to come with a theological question, it will only come if the space is open for them to narrate what, what's disturbing them, what they're wrestling with, um, if they're able to articulate those, um, those places. And I, you know, again, this comes from my experience, but I tend to think that young people have a lot of things going on that they need someone to ask them how long. How long have you felt alone? How long have you looked in the mirror and saw that you weighed 800 pounds and you're wasting away and weigh 50. How long have you felt like no one could love you? How long have you felt like the only thing that will matter in life is if you get into a top flight school? Like giving them space to narrate that experience, it, it takes some of the exact, I think, disciplines that Christian is, is telling us um, and, and sharing with us. But, um, so I don't think if the point is, come with your theological questions, that will ever happen. But if it is, um, why are you so sad? Or how's your week been? Um, it's possible that those questions will come up. You want to add anything to that? Yeah. The questions. Thanks for the question, though. It was a great question. Hi. Hey. Um, I'll try to turn this into a question. It's kind of like a sort of a reflection, I guess, back um, as, as I was sort of processing what you were saying and then maybe just an invitation. I'll add a question mark at the end and yeah. turn it into a question. <laughs> so as, 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 if I'm understanding you correctly or at least trying to interpret it correctly, it seems like part of this theological turn is almost a rebellion against kind of a false or a bo broken view of what theology is. That we've turned theology into this headspace thing and we've turned ministry into this headspace thing and we've just lost people because we're more than heads, right? Because as, as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking of this, uh, in the Orthodox world, it's become almost axiomatic. Evagoras of Pontus has this line that, you know, the, the, the theologian is one who prays, and the one who prays is the true theologian. That, like, theology is not simply this abstract knowledge, but communion, right? And, like, when we, phrase the, when we frame theology as sons, it's an entrance into the life of God then like that has such a profound ministry implications because all of this is just it's communal it's like if anything it's like a return to theology rather than theology that we maybe print on a diploma um yeah so that's kind of like me wrestling with yes. that and chewing that and i'm gonna add a question mark for the sake of making it a question toss it right back yeah i'm trying to think of a witty way to respond uh respond but i uh, yeah i think that's exactly um exactly right that there there has to be I mean, this sense of the theologian is the one who prays. Um, what I'm ultimately really interested in, and have been for a decade and continue to be, is how is it that human beings, and how do we articulate this, particularly in the late modern world we live in, how, in, particularly young people, how do we articulate how they experience the very presence of God? And then how do we form our practices around our confessions of how it is that God actually moves. Why I'm opposed to thinking of ministry as a technology is because it tends to be about getting to some kind of um, growth in some kind of exponential way that tends to take us away from trying to actually correlate the very practices we do with our understanding of how, God, how it is that God encounters us. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, that's where we're going here. So for Bonhoeffer, you know, like the, the, under, the underneath kind of theological move here is that Jesus Christ encounters us in the encounter of our neighbor and in the encounter of the humanity of this young pe person when personhood collides jesus christ is there and so that's what becomes so i think really quite profound here um, is that he just embraces the personhood of this of this young person um, and it leads i think for 
for Bonhoeffer, Jesus Christ is present there. And that's why he's thrown back in this holy moment. When he's critiquing Brunner, it's like, well, this is a book review. And so you say how they didn't meet the intellectual standard. But all of a sudden, when there's this boy asking this question, um, now you're encountering the living presence of Jesus Christ. Um, so I think you're right. I mean, this is just what, what has happened in, in the interesting unfolding of, of Protestant theological education is it's become a head, a head thing, and we've lost some of those deep kind of practices. Um, but for me, ministry becomes a really interesting way to think about the theological task is so deeply connected with ministry itself because ministry, however you define it, becomes a place where we encounter the living presence of Jesus Christ. And that God's very act and being is one who comes to minister to us. That Israel knows this God as the God who leads them out of Egypt, who comes and hears their cry and ministers to them. So then we can share in God's very act and being by receiving and giving ministry herself. Um, and I think the very feeling of that, the way we would articulate what that feels like is joy. That we feel the joy of being shared in, of a, of a hypostatic union at a divine and human level, um, and even at a human-human level that reflects um, God's own hypostatic life. So, I just wanted to get a little orthodoxy of that. <laughs> As I've been sitting here, I've been wrestling with um, whether the paradigm of kenosis is the best way to connect with our youth. Yeah. And you mentioned that this, um, uh, the paradigm of kenosis is really helpful because you talk about a culture of narcissism, essentially. Um, but I don't know if that's necessary in, um, in this overwhelming pressure to create authentic selves. But I don't know if that's what I get from my high school kids. I, um, I sense a lot of pressure to be the same. And so I'm having a hard time yeah. struggling with this, um, this paradigm of kenosis and connecting with them when I actually think what they could use a little bit more of is some encouragement to be more authentic people. And perhaps kenosis leads to that, but I don't know if that's the yeah. best platform yeah. in my context. It's a great question. Do you want, do you want to respond? Do you want me to answer? Go for it. I mean, I have a couple. I have yeah, a couple go for it. You go yeah. first. You go yeah. first, because I'll I, just ramble on. I, I think you're right. I think there is like this this tension uh, in in like the drive toward authenticity, right? And that's kind of why I, I said it's not simply enough to express my authentic self, but like I need you to validate that authentic self, right? Because um, there is that that this trap of like of authenticity and self expression, right? That well, how do you really express yourself? Well, you have to go to like the right stores and buy the right clothes that somebody else made, so that you can let them express you for you, right? Uh, so I think I think that that's to me where the the practice, especially particularly of Bible study and confession, actually does draw to deep authenticity, where we come to see who we who we really are uh, through through the lens of the scriptures, right? That we can read Luke twenty four, for example, and see that we are the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Uh, that Christ journeys with us, that we're sad about something, that we're lost about something. And so uh, the question for us becomes, what are we sad about? Uh, what are we lost about? How, how are we looking for God uh, and trying to understand what has just happened in this weird like, turn of events, right? Um, and so I, I, do, I do think that what, what Andy's talking about in terms of making, making a safe space for uh, for youth to be able to articulate their experiences, their real experiences, does actually reinforce a true move toward authenticity so that one can actually encounter Christ through this kind of shared presence, the shared suffering, right? Um, it's not simply enough to express the self, but rather to come to know the self. Again, this is why St. Isaac says that it is a greater miracle to know one as one truly is than it is to raise the dead. Um, so even in our best moves toward authenticity, we we're not, we're not doing it, right? Like, that, there's a great, a great irony in that. Um, so I think that, to me, is, is maybe the, the, start, the starting point, because you're right, like, there is this pressure to be the same, right? That's why all the people who really want to be themselves all shop at Hot Topic and look the same. Right? Like, because that, that's who I, that's who I am. I'm a whatever. Um, but that isn't who we really are. That's the thing that we buy. That, literally, it's a thing we literally buy. Um, so I, I guess maybe that's, I don't know that I really answered your question. No, that's, but. that's good. The only thing I would add is there's a, a new book that's just out um, called The Happiness Effect. Have people seen this book? Um, 
you can find a, this is a, ter a terrible self-promotion. You can find a review. I've reviewed it in, in Christianity Today. You can find it online. Uh, but it's a, a fascinating book. She, uh, this woman who uh, did the study, um, I don't know, she did interviews with over 300 college students. And her basic point is it's all about the, a social media age. And so it's called the happiness effect because what she's discovered is for these young adults, these university students, that social media is never a place where you can articulate anything but a happy life. Um, that you actually use it to project how successful things are going for you. And any kind of articulation of depression, of fear, those you you are not supposed to put that on your social media site. That you are, and they even talk about um, curating your image. And what's the most fascinating about that is the reason that these young adults believe that's what you do with the social media is because that's what their parents and admissions people at colleges told them they're supposed to do, and they believe us. Like, don't put anything personal out online because then you're going to interview for a job at some point, and they're going to look back and see all this, and you're never going to get it. And so her her point basically in this book is that at least these you know middle class college-educated, privileged young people, uh, university students, have a deep forms of suffering that they have nowhere to articulate them. And that social media kind of creates more of a glossy way, and it makes them feel worse because then they look at all their friends and they're like, oh my gosh, she has a beautiful boyfriend and everything's going well for her because you only put the good things out there. So when I say kenosis, I think what we mean is not that you do something, but that it is enacting again this narrative of Jesus' own movement of, of cross to resurrection. So there is something, I think, about Christian discipleship that one has to confess their impossibility. There has to be a space where we ask how long, and one says and, and confesses this. And that becomes the canonic act that actually, if it self-empties you, it doesn't self-empty you to be a spiritual giant. It self-empties you enough to say, I need a minister. That no human being can be created, no human being can live without, being, without another who will minister to them. And Eberhard Jungel, the German Lutheran um, theologian, does this great thing about the, the original, um, the fall. He thinks really is this kind of sense of, um, of Adam and Eve in that story, essentially saying they will live outside of nothingness. That only God and God's being lives without ex nihilo, without nothingness. And um, Adam and Eve are created out of, out of nothingness as gift and they decide they no longer want that. So they essentially want to be gods and live outside of nothingness. And so he's trying to connect creation with justification, saying what justification does is it reinstates the ex nihilo through God's own person in Jesus Christ. So now the, the authentic, the truly authentic Christian life is to always be confessing one's experiences of impossibility. Because when one confesses their impossibility, they say, I need a minister and they find the only God who comes to us is a God who comes to minister to us. Um, and so it's, it's, I don't know that, you know, I think it is this kind of disposition of, can we create young people, can we take on practice that they can be brave enough to confess their impossibility. And in this cultural time, whether it's this kind of consumer thing to all look the same, or it's social media that says, you can't publicly say things are going bad because that's not what you do. Can we create spaces where we can, Ask the how long questions. So, I think that's trying to do, trying to go in that direction. So, thanks. Great question. Questions. We beat you into submission. Oh no! I'm going to stand right up and prove that you have not. <laughs> On behalf of all of us, uh, I want to go back to the question about when are we going to see our children present us with theological questions? And part of your answer is they might not frame it as a theological question, but it's a space into which God will move. That usually requires a predicate relationship. So could you speak, either one of you, to the quotidian walk with young people that does not have canonic moments that, that have uh, a glow around them, but creates the possibility for that to happen by grace when it happens? Go for it. Let's both start talking and see what happens. Uh, and, see, and see if you can go longer. Yeah. All right, so um, my response is to tell you another Bonhoeffer story that maybe gives us a, a few practices here. And I think it also, one of the dangers that I don't want you to hear, even with the move to the theological, is like, oh, the 
the tradition doesn't matter anymore. You just live in the experience. I actually think there's even a deeper onus to grab from the tradition, to use the tradition to help inform and, and as a lens. And Dietrich did that himself. One of the most famous Bonhoeffer youth ministry stories is this confirmation class he took over, about 1933-ish. And he gets a call from his synod and says, we have a pastor who's nearing retirement. He's got a group of boys, and things are not good. Would you take them over? We have no idea why the synod calls him. Uh, my imagination is he's the best youth worker that they know about, and they go to their ace, and they call him in. So the story goes that Dietrich walks in with his old pastor named Johannes Mueller, and they walk in, and all the boys are up above, and they see them walking up. And this is how out of control this class is. They start throwing banana peels and garbage down on them as they walk up the stairs. They get to the top, and Pastor Mueller pushes them all into the room. Get in the room, and he's yelling at them, and they're, they're just rowdy. He gets into the room, and he says over their noise, he shouts, your new teacher is Herr Dr. Bonhoeffer, and he turns around and leaves. Um, and as he's leaving, he hears all the boys start chanting in unison, bon, 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 and he's just out of there, which makes me think, like, what's going on in his mind? Like, they're going to kill Bonhoeffer. He's like, I'm done. Like, my responsibility is over. Whatever blood is spilled in that room, it's no longer, it's no longer on my hands. I, I wash my hands with this. And he, he goes. And the boys just keep chanting, Bon, 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 Bon. What Dietrich does is he just stays there. And he just keeps his composure. He just holds his composure. And then at about this level, he starts telling them a story about New York, about his time in Harlem. And only the boys in the front can hear it. But then they stop so they can listen in. And then it's like a wave. Each boy is silent. And he finishes this story about Harlem. And he says, if you come back next week, I'll tell you another story. He does two things that are incredibly profound that become the predicate that allows a deep transformation. This class becomes a, a, a completely different experience. He's one, he keeps his composure. And by keeping his composure, he says, you know, what matters is at some point we have to counter each other's humanity. It's not about me getting to the lesson. It's not about me getting some badge that I'm a great youth worker. We have to encounter each other. So I'm going to hold composure, even up against my anxiety, the practices that, that Christian was saying. I'm going, to, I'm going to wait in this space. And then the second thing, he tells some stories, which reveal his own personhood, that allows for the possibility of an encounter, um, in an eventful encounter of personhood. And so stories that not are actually, kid, tell me a story, but these are the confessed stories, the testimonies of the people of God, I think starts to open up that trail for that to happen. Now, the sadistically funny end of that story is that Dietrich actually writes a letter to a friend, a Swiss friend named Erwin Schutz, that talks about uh, his confirmation experience. He's saying, really, for the first time ever in my youth ministry, I've had disciplinary problems. And this is the real line. He says, so much so that the boys actually killed their first teacher. And they did. Three weeks after he gave up the class, poor Pastor Mueller had a heart attack and died. And Dietrich had to take them to their funeral and stand with them. So he, if you think your confirmation class is bad, Bonhoeffer's <laughs> literally killed their first, their first teacher. Um, but it transforms that group. And he even tells in that same letter, he tells Schutz, he says, I don't really prepare. And he says, well, I mean, this is classic arrogant Bonhoeffer. He's like, well, listen, I mean, I know the tradition really well. I mean, I'm Dietrich Bonhoeffer, so like, I know this stuff. But he says, I just go in, and I start talking about the biblical story. And I weave in my experiences, and I give the boys space to weave in their experiences, exactly the practice that Christian's talking about. And he says, it's transformed our groups. He says, they're, they're boys. They love apocalyptic stories. Some things never change. Uh, and so there's these two practices that I think create the, the, the predicate. Is, can we hold our composure? Not because we have to have that kind of psychological disposition, but can we simply say, um, I'm open to what happens here. And eventually what matters to me is that we, that we get to know each other, that we encounter each other. And then are we willing to open our lives up? Um, is the onus on us as church, um, even as adults, to be able to do that? And maybe part of what it means to be, if you're the paid youth ministry person, is to help adults keep their composure what we expect, if, if you're teaching Sunday school and it goes awful, it's all right. Be yourself. Be yourself. It's okay. It's not the point. 
it, you're off the hook. If this goes poorly, it's on me. You just, you, just be you. Just do, just, just hold your composure and know that, that we're going to support you no matter what. Um, and then maybe it's helping them think about what it means to testify to their own Mr. Wolf stories, to be able to share those uh, with young people. Um, so maybe those are the predicates. Anything to add? Yeah, I think I think like one of the I mean with with any relationship, right? One of the things that again, like here I am studying Andy, and he's right here. <laughs> it's weird, but uh, he'll talk about in his books is this idea of approaching with no agenda, you know, of, of just kind of being interested, seeing the relationship itself as an end, uh, that it's not a means to this way of like getting a kid to believe a certain thing or whatever it may be. Just in the same way that. Uh, we, we become friends with people with no agenda. We just delight in their person. And so we want to spend time with them and we invite them to our things. And we say, hey, I want to go uh, get coffee or whatever it may be. Uh, because I think if we're, again, if we're expecting that every conversation or something that we would have with a young person in the context of ministry is going to be this like really deep like, existential admission of nothingness, uh, we're setting ourselves up for failure, right? And we're almost going to have to, in some ways, try to create and fabricate these situations where people are, are emoting to, uh, to move into nothingness rather than to become aware of it. Um, and so I, I think that one of the things that we do need to find some way of, of doing responsibly, and I'm not exactly sure what that looks like, but is, is finding ways to, to reintegrate the life of, of the church so that all people are living together in some capacity. Um, one, one of the things that my, that my wife does with one of the kids in our youth group is they, just, they get together to go hiking um, and they just go for hikes. They don't necessarily, you know, go with this thing like, oh, I, I need to talk or whatever it may be, but they just, they both like hiking and so they both go hiking and that, is, and that has facilitated a really deep relationship between, uh, between, the, two, between the two of them. And uh, I think looking for ways, even if it's at, you know, fellowship hour or whatever, say, hey, why don't you come and sit with, like, the 27-year-olds over here? Like, we're all chatting, and you're six. I mean, as a 16-year-old kid and a bunch of 27-year-olds had asked me to <laughs> come sit with them, I'd have been like, okay, you know, and to start to begin to feel... Yeah, all <laughs> yeah. So they're all the, or, the Orthodox. They have all yeah. That's what we have done in our churches. They're all yeah, exactly. Churches. Yeah. But, I mean, you find, you find ways to, I think, include young people into the life of what's already happening, so that they feel that their own life is a part of this greater life of the church, that their own part, their own life is this uh, part of our lives as well. And so there does become this like hypostatic union between people, right? This place where we can participate in one another as we participate in Christ. And it's something that's built over, over time and over board games. And uh, I think that's, o that's okay, you know, that we don't have to always be like sinking into the depths of, you know, noetic silent prayer to be able to find that kind of community, I, I, I think, I suspect anyway. Yeah. All right. I want to thank you all for coming today, and I want to thank Andy Root and Christian Gonzalez for a lovely shared time. Thank you.